module G, power calculations. This is the last module of this online training course. And uh, in this module, we will talk about analytical and simulation based approaches to power and sample size calculations in clinical trials with multiplicity issues. I will talk a bit at first about traditional analytical approaches and uh, we will then switch to simulation based methods for power calculations in the context of uh, clinical scenario evaluation and we will discuss the general concept of clinical scenario evaluation. I will also mention clinical trial optimization but I would like to point out that a separate online training course on the broad topics of clinical scenario evaluation and clinical trial optimization will be available soon. And um, in fact, it may be available by the time you're taking this course. And because of that, I will provide only a high level summary, a high level discussion of clinical trial optimization, a detailed review of different approaches to clinical trial optimization will be beyond the scope of this multiplicity course. And finally, I will introduce the Mediana package. I know we have used a couple of functions from this package in software implementation sections uh, throughout this course, but I would like to point out that we have in reality only scratched the surface. This is a very powerful package that supports simulation based power and sample size calculations in numerous settings that we see in late stage clinical trials. Section G1, power calculations in clinical trials with multiple objectives. We will begin with a traditional analytical approach to power and sample size calculations. And I will jump ahead a little bit. Uh, this will be done mostly to point out limitations of the analytical approaches. Standard sample size calculations, as you know, are based on analytical solutions or closed form expressions. And generally you expect to have a formula which you would apply to compute the number of patients or number of events in a trial with a time to event outcome. This formula that you see on this slide is a standard formula used in trials with a normally distributed endpoint. This sample size per treatment arm is a very simple function of the type 1 and type 2 error rates denoted by alpha and beta. It also depends on the delta, which is the true mean treatment difference, and the sigma. And that is the true common standard deviation. It is a great formula. I only wish that we could use it more often in clinical trial settings when it comes to phase 3 clinical trials. So why did I say that I only wish we could use the formula more often? That is simply because this formula is valid under a number of rather restrictive assumptions. It assumes, as shown on slide 6, a simple two-arm design. It assumes that we have a single endpoint that follows a normal distribution. It assumes a balanced design. It assumes that there are no stratification factors, which means that we assume a homogeneous treatment effect across the trial population. Well, real life clinical trials, especially modern phase three clinical trials, employ complex designs. They employ complex decision rules and they generally look much more complicated than the basic standard setting that we introduced on slide six, clinical trials with multiple arms, which means multiple doses or active control arms are very common. We see very commonly in phase three development, multiple clinical endpoints, including multiple primary and multiple secondary endpoints. Multiple patient populations are also very common. And in addition to that, the topic we have not discussed in this multiplicity course is the fact that interim looks and different types of mid-course adaptations are fairly common in phase three clinical trials. Since analytical approaches to sample size determination are not applicable in the setting, we will need to discuss an alternative set of approaches. <laughs> 
And this leads us to a discussion of the role of the general analytical approach and closed form expressions for the number of patients to be enrolled in a trial. Closed form expressions used in standard sample size calculations very often rely on simplifying and sometimes even artificial assumptions that may be difficult to justify in a real clinical trial. And by making these simplifying assumptions, we begin to slowly deviate from the truth. One simplifying assumption is probably okay, but where exactly do we draw a line here? As statisticians, how do we justify those simplifying assumptions to our project teams? We may say that we made a few simplifying assumptions because we wanted to get a quick answer for our trials, but is it okay to cut corners in multi-million dollar clinical trials? The answer to these questions is that we need to rely more on simulation-based approaches when it comes to power and sample size calculations in phase two and phase three clinical trials because they are much more reliable, especially when we deal with complex designs and analysis strategies. And in fact, in many complex phase three clinical trials, analytical approaches and closed form expressions are simply not available. To support our focus on alternative approaches to performing power calculations, in clinical trials that employ several clinical objectives, the EMA guidance on multiplicity emphasizes in section 5.1 that simple methods based on closed form solutions do not work anymore in this more, more complex setting. It is stated in this document that sometimes a series of related objectives is pursued in the same trial each with its own primary variable. In these situations, planning of the sample size becomes more complex due to the different alternative hypotheses related to the different endpoints and due to the assumed correlation between endpoints. What I would like to point out is that Section 5 focuses on clinical trials with multiple endpoints, but of course the main message, the main set of recommendations presented in this section uh, clearly uh, clearly applicable to a very broad setting, a very broad class of trials with several clinical objectives that gives rise to multiplicity. And the FDA's guidance takes one step further and explicitly recommends computer simulations over analytic formulas that are no longer applicable in trials with one or more sources of multiplicity. In section three of this guidance documents emphasizes that determination of an appropriate study sample size to ensure that the study is appropriately powered can be difficult in these cases and often will be dependent upon computer simulations rather than an analytic formula which can be used for simpler situations. The alternative approach that we will focus on in this module is to perform simulation-based assessments of relevant trial designs and applicable analysis strategies. The key feature of this general simulation-based approach is that it liberates us from artificial assumptions, artificial restrictions that we would be required to make when we go down the traditional path. And the simulation-based approach also provides answers to complex clinically important questions in trials with multiple objectives. And of course, simulation-based approaches require access to computational power, but it is no longer a concern. As a quick relevant example, you may know that probit regression was much more popular before statisticians started actively using computers simply because it was more convenient from a computational perspective. But we all now use primarily logistic regression, and that's because the results are easier to interpret and more meaningful. We can talk about odds ratios, for example. We're no longer limited by artificial restrictions, similar to those that force statisticians to use private models. And likewise, when it comes to simulation-based approaches in clinical trials,
with multiple objectives or in a general setting, we should take full advantage of available computing power. Introduction to Clinical Scenario Evaluation One of the goals of this module is to very briefly introduce the Clinical Scenario Evaluation Framework, which is a general framework, a set of concepts developed in several recent publications. The term clinical scenario evaluation was introduced in the paper by Norbert Benda and uh, his colleagues, as well as other publications, including the paper by Tim Friede and, and his colleagues. And in very simple terms, the clinical scenario evaluation approach is best described by the following three words, quantitative, comprehensive, and disciplined. We will focus on the quantitative and comprehensive, or in other words, systematic aspects of clinical scenario evaluation approach, and the discipline component becomes relevant in the context of so-called sensitivity assessments that I will not cover in this module because, again, it's beyond the scope of this course. When we look at the general goals of the clinical scenario evaluation approach, this approach supports systematic simulation-based assessment of trial designs and analysis methods in clinical trials or sometimes even across development programs. And uh, the key motivation behind this framework is that the clinical scenario evaluation framework supports evidence-based approaches to designing clinical trials and to selecting appropriate analysis methods rather than relying on traditional or ad hoc approaches. And the clinical scenario evaluation is structured and it supports workflows that mimic the process of collecting, analyzing, and evaluating clinical trial data. In a certain sense, the role of clinical scenario evaluation is similar to that of the periodic table of elements, in that it provides a structured approach to studying trial designs and available analysis methods. It is helpful to recognize the importance of deconstructing complex problems that arise in clinical trials. And specifically, the clinical scenario evaluation approach encourages clinical trial sponsors, clinical trial statisticians to break down a complex problem of holistic evaluation of all components of a clinical trial to the key elements or steps, such as the specification of parameters of the data generation process, known as the data model, specification of the analysis methods, known as an analysis model, and finally, evaluation criteria that are closely aligned with the clinical objectives of a particular trial that's known as an evaluation model. And with a clinical scenario evaluation, we can examine individual or synergistic effects of multiple design and analysis parameters. The key components of the general clinical scenario evaluation approach that I mentioned on slide 15 are defined in more detail on the slide. We begin with uh, data models. And by the way, here I'm going to use more descriptive terms such as data models, analysis models, and evaluation models. But I would like to point out that in the original publications on uh, clinical scenario evaluation, those components were labeled assumptions, options and metrics respectively. So beginning with data models, they describe the data generation mechanism in a clinical trial. The goal of analysis models is to define statistical tests, descriptive statistics and other analysis tools. It includes, of course, multiplicity adjustments. That's the main goal of uh, this online training course. And those are the elements that would be computed from the trial data that were generated using the applicable data model or data models. And the last component relies on evaluation models. And those specify measures for evaluating performance 
of the analysis strategies that were defined in the second component in analysis models. And I will walk you through the process of defining these components or these models when we begin performing power calculations in uh, phase three trials with multiple dose placebo comparisons and the multiple patient population using the median package. It will be done in the software implementation section at the end of this module. A closely related concept, I would say it's the next natural step, is clinical trial optimization, which is aimed ultimately at optimal selection of design and analysis parameters, including parameters of multiplicity adjustments based on clinically relevant criteria. <coughs> Within the general clinical trial optimization framework, when we look at the general theme of clinical trial optimization, we utilize clinical scenario evaluation to transition from traditionally used, sometimes ad hoc approaches to optimal approaches. And by this, I mean optimal approaches to selecting, again, trial designs, analysis strategies, including multiplicity adjustments, which is the main topic of uh, this online training course. And the overall goal of clinical trial optimization will then be to help inform the decision-making process at different stages of a drug development program to maximize the overall probability of success. As we think about applications of clinical trial optimization, these approaches can be applied and they have been successfully applied, beginning with more straightforward problems, for example, optimal selection of the sample size allocation in a traditional trial, as well as more challenging problems, such as optimal selection of analysis models, of course, an appropriate example, in the context of this course would be optimal selection of a multiplicity adjustment in a clinical trial with several objectives, as well as optimal selection of individual parameters, for example, hypothesis weights in a multiple testing procedure. I would like to mention other examples of clinical trial optimization that were considered in recent papers in the context of phase two and phase three trials, we can apply general clinical trial optimization approaches to identify, for example, optimal multiplicity adjustments in clinical trials with several endpoints, optimal decision rules at interim looks in a clinical trial that employs an adaptive design, and another example is optimal decision rules in clinical trials with several patient populations. Uh, here's a quick list of recent publications that deal with the general topic of clinical trial optimization. It includes a book. The title of this book is Clinical Trial Optimization Using R. This book features multiple case studies from late stage clinical trials and it provides multiple examples that show how to perform simulation-based calculations and identify optimal designs, optimal analysis strategies using the Mediana package. And speaking of the Mediana package, we are ready to take a closer look at this R package. In this uh, section, I will provide a high-level summary of key features of the Mediana package. It's an R package that was released in 2015. We started working on this package uh, two years before that, and the main idea behind the package was to provide a systematic, standardized approach to clinical trial simulations. The goal was to facilitate a systematic simulation-based assessment of candidate trial designs, applicable analysis methods, and given this overall goal, it's not surprising that we decided to build this package around the clinical scenario evaluation approach. This package provides a general framework for clinical trial simulations that are typically performed in phase two and uh, phase three trials. And this package has been used to support clinical trial optimization 
aimed at, it, at identifying optimal trial designs and analysis strategies. I will go very quickly through the key features of the Mediana package. And my goal here is to mostly highlight that it supports all commonly used data models, analysis models, and evaluation models. And I'm using here the terminology used in clinical scenario evaluation. To remind you, a data model defines the data generation mechanism in a clinical trial. What we do within a data model is we can handle all commonly used endpoint types. For example, clinical trials with a single endpoint and univariate distributions are available for continuous, binary, time to event, and count endpoints. The package also handles very efficiently data models for trials with multiple endpoints, which is very important for us when we discuss multiplicity issues in clinical trials. And popular trial design options are also supported within this package. For example, various patient enrollment and dropout modeling options. An analysis model, as we said, defines key components of an analysis strategy in a trial, which includes uh, statistical tests, uh, parametric tests, non-parametric tests, and model-based analysis methods. It also includes descriptive statistics that are computed from the trial data. And of course, we should not forget about popular multiplicity adjustments. The Mediana package supports all adjustments used in traditional multiplicity problems that we introduced in modules C, D, and E. And it also supports advanced multiplicity adjustments known as gatekeeping procedures that will be presented in part two of this course. We have also talked about evaluation models that specify measures for evaluating the performance of the selected analysis models or strategies defined by the user and all broadly used definitions of probability of success have been implemented in the Mediana package. By this I mean marginal power of each individual test in the multiplicity problem, and also disjunctive power which is defined as the probability that at least one test in a multiplicity problem is significant. And conjunctive power is another good example. Uh, this measure is defined as the probability that all tests in a problem are simultaneously significant. And in addition to that, other fairly complex metrics based on statistical and clinical significance can also be enabled within evaluation models supported by the Mediana package. As I said, this will be a quick summary of key features supported by the Mediana package. And I mentioned here very quickly that popular trial designs are supported, beginning with the fixed trial designs. In other words, in this case, we're looking at standard trial designs with a predefined sample size. Event-driven trial designs are also supported these designs are used very commonly in trials with time to event endpoints, for example, survival type endpoints. In this case, the sample size, as you know, is not fixed. It's actually selected to achieve the target number of events. With any simulation-based approach, we need to think carefully about employing efficient algorithms to avoid situations where it may take hours and hours, if not days, to run simulations. And we have spent a good amount of time thinking about issues that are related to high-performance computing. The Mediana package fully supports computations that are parallelized to speed up simulations. Parallel computations are performed behind the scenes. You don't even need to worry about them. The package supports simulations that are distributed across multiple processors or cores, and this substantially reduces computation times. And finally, this is my last slide related to the Mediana package. A few words about uh, downloading and using this package and its documentation. The package, as I said, was released in 2015. It is available on the CRAN website you will find a detailed reference manual on 
this web page. It's a standard uh, PDF document. But personally, instead of using the PDF document that's available on the CREN website, I really enjoy using this online manual uh, that's available on the website set up by uh, Gautier Po, who made multiple important contributions to the Mediana package. It is maintained uh, by Gautier as well. And um, I would also like to use this opportunity to thank other people who have contributed to this package. It's been a truly collaborative effort. And in fact, if you were interested in contributing to our work on this R package, I would love to encourage you to give uh, it a try and please send me an email. Example four, type two diabetes trial. So far, I have introduced a general simulation-based approach to performing power calculations, as well as the Mediana package that was designed to support simulation-based calculations in late-stage clinical trials. And we are now ready to apply this knowledge to run power calculations in two case studies with multiple clinical objectives. This first example, example four, is based on a type 2 diabetes trial with multiple dose placebo comparisons. And the next example, example five, is based on an oncology trial where multiplicity is induced by the analysis of treatment effect in two patient populations. A general point I would like to emphasize throughout this case study and then in example five is that it will be important for us to follow a general thought process based on clinical scenario evaluation. This includes how to identify the data model and plausible sets of the data model parameters. We will need to think about the appropriate analysis approaches and try to account for all clinically and statistically relevant considerations to summarize the analysis results when we set up the evaluation model. But now back to example four, as a quick reminder, in this example four, multiplicity was induced by the analysis of three doses relative to placebo. The goal of the study was to characterize the efficacy profile of three doses of an experimental treatment. Those doses are denoted by dose one, dose two, and dose three. And our ultimate goal in this particular application is to compute the number of patients to guarantee a sufficiently high level of overall success probability in this clinical trial. To help motivate a simulation-based approach to power calculations in example four, we're going to first consider a naive approach that begins with a standard sample size formula that works in the case of two arm trials. And then this naive approach attempts to extend this formula to the four arm setting in example four. Yes, it may look quite naive, but believe me, I've seen it used in real clinical trials. As you can see on the slide, the thought process behind this extension is that with three dose placebo comparisons in example four, we can try to apply, for example, the bond for any adjustment to control the overall type on error rate. And what we can do here is we can take the standard sample size formula that we introduced on slide five. In this formula, there were two key parameters, alpha and beta, that denoted the type one and type two error probability. Since with the bond for any adjustment, we adjust the significance level for each individual test, how about we're going to take the standard sample size calculation formula and we're going to replace the alpha in this formula with the bond for any adjusted significance level, which is alpha over three. How meaningful will be the result? To perform a comparison of this naive approach to a recommended approach that involves simulations, we're going to make the following assumptions. Given that this is a example based on a phase three clinical trial, we're going to set the one-sided alpha to 0.025. The one-sided type two error rate will be beta 
of 0.2, which means that the power in the study will be set to 80%. And finally, we're going to assume a common effect size across the three dose placebo comparisons. This effect size is defined by dividing the true delta, the true mean difference at each dose by the common standard deviation sigma. We're going to assume that this ratio is equal to 0.3. Let me first quickly compare the standard sample size approach without any adjustment. In this case, we can easily show that when we apply the standard sample size formula with the original alpha of 0.025, the resulting common sample size per arm is going to be 175 patients. When we switch to the naive formula that attempts to incorporate a bond for any type adjustment, the sample size per arm is going to increase by 33% and we're going to end up with 233 patients per arm. What can we say about this analytical approach to performing sample size calculations in trials with several dose placebo comparisons? Well, we may suspect that it is unreliable, but it will be very helpful, very instructive to understand what specifically is wrong with this naive approach. To help answer this question, let us compute the key operating characteristics of the trial design based on the naive sample size formula that incorporates this bond for any type adjustment. We said earlier that the common sample size in this, uh, with this approach is going to be 233 patients per arm. Let us compute the marginal power for each dose placebo comparison, and by marginal power, I mean the probability that each individual dose placebo comparison is significant. This marginal power is going to be exactly 80%. And disjunctive power, which is commonly used in clinical trials with multiple objectives, it is defined in the context of this particular clinical trial example as the probability that at least one dose placebo comparison is significant, this disjunctive power is going to be equal to 95%. When we compare this naive approach to power calculations in this type 2 diabetes trial to the recommended approach that makes use of simulations, we can see that with the simulation-based evaluation, the common sample size per arm is only 145 patients. What are the operating characteristics of the resulting trial design? We can see here that unlike the naive approach, marginal power with the simulation-based approach is much lower. The probability that each individual dose placebo comparison will be significant is only 56%. And that is because our ultimate objective here is to ensure that the overall probability of success based on disjunctive power is going to be controlled and with the simulation-based approach, disjunctive power is in fact equal exactly 80%. So to summarize, the naive approach to sample size calculations that attempts incorrectly, obviously, incorporate a bond for any type adjustment results in overestimating the probability of success in the trial when we define the probability of success based on disjunctive power. The sample size was overestimated by 60%. Instead of 145 patients per trial arm, we ended up with 233 patients per trial arm it's obviously completely unacceptable, and this tells us one more time how important it is to utilize simulation-based approaches to computing power and sample size in trials with multiple clinical objectives. And a general simulation-based approach will be illustrated using the Mediana package. In what follows, I will show you how to perform simulation-based power calculations in this clinical trial, in example 4, using the Mediana package 
The Mediana package relies on the general clinical scenario evaluation framework, which means that we need to define the three main components, the data model, the analysis model, and the evaluation model. The first component is a data model shown on the slide that defines the process of generating patient data in a clinical trial. This model focuses on specifying the parameters of individual samples within a single trial, and samples are defined as mutually exclusive groups of patients. The data model includes the following specifications. First of all, we need to specify the outcome distribution or the distribution of the primary endpoint in this clinical study, as well as its parameters. Secondly, we need to define the samples that are defined once again as independent sets of patients. In this particular case, each sample will be equivalent to a trial arm. Then we're going to specify the parameters of the individual samples specifically the outcome distribution parameters and sample sizes, and finally, the overall trial design. Here on slide 36, we're going to dig a little bit deeper and point out that in this particular case, there are four samples. Sample one is going to correspond to the placebo arm, and the other three samples, labeled samples 2, 3, and 4, are going to correspond to the individual dosing arms in the trial. The outcome distribution, or the distribution of the primary variable, is normal, because the primary endpoint, based on the change in hemoglobin A1c, is assumed to be normally distributed, which means that we're going to use the keyword normal dist, to specify the outcome distribution and the trial design the last component of this data model is defined by a fixed design and when we say fixed design we mean a trial design with a fixed follow-up period which is defined as the period from a patient's enrollment to discontinuation the follow-up period is defined in this case by the 24 week treatment period that was one of the key specifications of this type 2 diabetes trial. And in general, I would like to add that the Mediana package also supports event-driven designs with a variable follow-up period. This setting is very common in trials with time-to-event outcomes, and we're going to use this setting in example 5. This table defines the outcome distribution parameters in the individual sample. The table lists the four samples in the data model. They are IDs, placebo, dose 1, dose 2, and dose 3, and also the individual parameters of the normal distribution of the primary variable within each sample. We're going to assume here for simplicity that the treatment effect is measured on the effect size scale. And to accomplish this, we're going to simply set the standard deviations across the four samples to 1. Then the mean, the first parameter of the outcome distribution, will be set to 0 in the placebo arm. And it will be set to 0.3 in the other three samples, because we assumed a common effect size of 0.3 across the dosing arms. This is the first piece of Mediana code, and what we do here is we specify four objects that define the outcome distribution parameters across the four samples in this data model. Each object is simply a list with two different values. The first value is mean, and the second value is standard deviation. And you can see here that those four objects correspond directly to the assumptions that we made on slide 38. Specifically, the common standard deviation is equal to 1, and the first parameter, mean, is equal to 0 in the placebo sample, and it's equal to 0 0.3 in all of the other samples within this data model. This code defines the data model in example 4. Let's take a closer look at the code. 
The first step is to initialize the data model. It is done by using an empty model defined by the data model function without any arguments. And then we use the standard plus notation to add or to introduce additional components that define the full data model in this example. The first component is the outcome distribution object. This object specifies the distribution of patient outcomes in this model, and it's based on a normal distribution. The second object is the sample size object. It specifies the common number of patients enrolled in each sample. In this case, we're going to assume a balanced trial design, which means that all samples are assumed to have the sample size. And this common sample size, as you can see on the slide, ranges between 130 and 150. Specifically, the sequence function is going to generate the following values for the common sample size. 130, 135, 140, 145, and then 150. And finally, we have four sample objects that specify parameters of each individual sample within this data model. The IDs of each individual sample show that those samples correspond to the four trial arms in this trial, and the objects that were defined earlier are going to be passed to the individual samples to specify the parameters of the normal distribution for the primary endpoint. Within the clinical scenario evaluation framework, an analysis model, as we said, defines the statistical methods, for example, significance tests that are applied to the trial data generated from the data model. And the key components of a general analysis model include, in this case, the three dose placebo tests and their parameters, and also a multiplicity adjustment. Secondly, when we look at the general evaluation model, those are used in the Mediana package to specify the success criteria or metrics for evaluating the performance of the analysis model, and they include success criteria and their parameters. This slide, slide 42, defines the individual elements of the analysis and evaluation models. First of all, the treatment effect at each dose is going to be assessed using the two-sample t-test, which is requested using the keyword t-test. We're going to apply here, mostly for the sake of illustration, the bond for any adjustment, which is requested using the keyword bond for any adjust. But I would like to point out that, of course, other adjustments could be used and they would be, in fact, recommended such as the Hogberg or Dunnett adjustment, because as we have discussed multiple times, those multiple testing procedures are more powerful, more efficient than the bond for any procedure. When we proceed to the uh, elements, key elements of the evaluation model, the success criteria or metrics for evaluating the performance of the individual tests and the selected multiplicity adjustment will be evaluated using marginal power for each individual dose placebo test. And that is requested using the marginal power keyword and also disjunctive power, which is once again the probability that at least one of the three dose placebo tests is significant. This one is requested by the disjunctive power keyword. This code implements the analysis model outlined on slide 42 using the Mediana package. The analysis model, just like the data model a few slides back, needs to be initialized using the empty analysis model function without any arguments. And then we're going to add one at a time the individual components of this analysis model. The first component is a multiplicity adjustment. In this particular case, it's based on the Bonferroni procedure. And then we're going to add the three dose placebo tests. Within each test object, we see the first uh, the, the ID that helps us identify this particular test. The second component is the samples argument 
this this argument defines the individual data samples to which this test will be applied for example the test that compares placebo to dose one will be applied to the data samples labeled placebo and dose one and those are defined within the data model and finally the method argument defines the two sample t-test next the evaluation model is defined using the mediana package we begin with an empty evaluation model specified by the evaluation model function without any arguments and then we add one criterion one success criterion at a time the first one is a criterion based on marginal power and that is specified using the method argument of this criterion function we make it clear that this is marginal power next we define this set of tests to which this particular criterion will be applied we would like to compute marginal power for all three dose placebo tests in this clinical trial next we specify the labels those are quite arbitrary they're just used mostly for our convenience and the last parameter here is the par argument that defines the one-sided alpha level to be used in the success criterion the specification of the evaluation model continues on slide 45 we have one more criterion to define and this criterion is based on the disjunctive power we again specify the tests to which this criterion will be applied using the tests argument in this particular case as you can see from this code disjunctive power is defined as the probability that at least one of those three tests will be significant and the level of significance is defined using the power parameter again it's a one-sided alpha of 0 0.025 we're almost done after the data model analysis model and evaluation models have been set up we are ready to run calculations to compute the two metrics or success criteria that we specified in the evaluation model that, in, that is uh, marginal power and disjunctive power and the very last step for us now is to define simulation parameters using a sim parameters object this object has the following parameters the first one and dot sims is the number of simulation runs the next one is the proc load it's probably the most interesting parameter here it defines the processor load for parallel computations as i explained earlier in this module the mediana package makes heavy use of parallel simulations and in this case this parameter is set to full which means that the simulations will be run across all available processor cores which will definitely speed up the simulations the last parameter is the random seed which will be used in simulations to ensure that the simulation results will be reproducible and now we can pass the three models we have defined and this set of simulation parameters to the scse function and of course a cse stands for clinical scenario evaluation this function will take a few seconds to run the simulations the simulation results will be saved and we can quickly create a summary of the simulation results using the summary function the simulation results are summarized in this table the table shows that with the common sample size per arm of 145 patients disjunctive power is very close to 80 percent in this particular set of simulations based on 10,000 simulation runs the estimated disjunctive power is 79.9 percent and i would like to remind you that with any simulation based sample size calculation the final sample size is found by performing a grid search what we do is we review a range of sample sizes in this particular case the sample size per arm as you remember was set to range from 130 patients to 150 patients so we review this range of sample sizes and we select the sample size that corresponds to the desirable level of the probability of success 
In this case, we conclude that if we are shooting for an 80% probability of success based on disjunctive power, we will need to enroll 145 patients per arm in this trial. And of course, we're assuming here a somewhat simplified setting. We do not take into account dropouts, but dropout modeling can be incorporated when we define a data model in the Mediana package. The next example is example five. In this case, we're going to consider a clinical trial with multiple patient populations. It's based on the non-small cell lung cancer trial that we introduced back in module A. I would like to remind you that the overall goal of this trial was to characterize the efficacy profile of a novel treatment versus placebo in two patient populations, specifically in the overall trial population and a predefined subpopulation of patients with a marker positive result at baseline. And this analysis of the treatment effect in two patient populations induces multiplicity in this trial. We're going to use the Mediana package to run a series of simulations with the goal of computing the number of events to guarantee a sufficiently high level of overall probability of success. And we're focusing on the number of events as opposed to the number of patients because the uh, primary analysis in this clinical trial is formulated in terms of the time to an event. We're going to begin with the data model specifications. And this slide defines the four samples included in this model. The concept of samples in the data model was defined earlier. We use it in example four. Samples are non-overlapping, homogeneous groups of patients in a clinical trial. In this case study, the overall population of patients is naturally split into four samples that are defined on this slide. The samples are labeled one through four. The first sample includes placebo patients with a marker negative status at baseline, then placebo patients with a marker positive status, and then likewise samples three and four include patients who were assigned to receive treatment, but they have a marker negative or a marker positive status at baseline respectively. The samples are homogeneous in the sense that the effect, for example, a a hazard rate is constant across the patients included in each individual sample. And another important parameter for us to specify in this data model is the prevalence of marker positive patients. The prevalence is set to 60% based on historical data. And this parameter determines the relative sizes of the individual samples in this data model. With a 60% prevalence of marker positive patients in the general population, the number of patients in samples two and four will be 60% of the total sample size in this trial. The other two components of the data model include the outcome distribution and the trial's design. We're going to assume that the primary endpoint follows an exponential distribution. And when it comes to the trial design, we're going to consider an event-driven design without censoring. And when I say without censoring, that means that every patient is followed until disease progression, which means that the number of events is going to be equal to the number of enrolled patients here, because our ultimate objective here is to compute the target number of events. This table summarizes the parameters of the outcome distribution, the exponential distribution within each individual sample. We're going to begin with a set of assumptions about the median PFS. As you can see here that it's equal to 11 months within sample one and sample two. And that is because the marker that is used to define the subset of marker positive patients is predictive but may not be necessarily prognostic. And there is no difference in terms of the effect within placebo patients who are either 
marker positive or marker negative. But when we proceed to the assumptions for the median PFS in samples three and four, and these are the samples that consist of patients who are allocated to receive the novel treatment, we can see here that in patients with a marker negative status, the PF median PFS is increased to uh, 12.5 months. And in patients who receive treatment and happen to have a marker positive status, the median PFS is increased to 15 months. Using this information and assuming an exponential distribution, we can compute the rate parameter or the hazard rate. And those calculations are presented in the rightmost column in this table. This piece of code on slide 53 simply summarizes the assumptions that we presented in slide 52. We create four objects that store the assumed values of the hazard rate of the exponential distribution for the primary endpoint within each sample. And the uh, suffix that we see, for example, the, for the first object, PN, indicates that this is the set of assumptions for placebo patients with a marker negative outcome. Uh, PP, for example, stands for placebo patients with a marker positive status. Secondly, when we specify the sample sizes within each individual sample, we assume that the total number of patients, which is the same as the total number of events in this clinical trial, is set to 530 using this total sample size and using the assumed prevalence of marker positive patients, we can easily compute the sizes or the numbers of patients in each individual sample as shown on this slide. Slide 55 defines the resulting data model. The overall process is very similar to what we saw in example four. We begin with an empty data model. Then we specify the distribution of the outcome variable of the primary variable, which is exponential. And then we specify the parameters of each individual sample object, beginning with its ID, the sample size, the number of patients to be included in this sample and the outcome parameter specifies the parameter of the exponential distribution or the hazard rates, rates that we defined earlier. The remaining two components, the analysis model and the evaluation model in example five are defined on this slide. And beginning with the analysis model, we need to set up the treatment effect tests in the two populations and their parameters, which includes a multiplicity adjustment. And with the evaluation model, we need to specify a success criterion, criteria and their parameters as we did in example four. Slide 56 defines the key components of the analysis model and the evaluation model in this clinical trial example. Beginning with the analysis model, the treatment effect in each patient population will be assessed using the log rank test. And the keyword that requests this test is log rank. The multiplicity adjustment will be performed based on the Hogberg procedure. The evaluation model will have exactly the same structure as before. We're going to compute marginal power for each population test as well as disjunctive power, which will be defined as the probability of detecting a significant treatment effect in at least one patient population. Slide 58 defines the code for setting up the analysis model in example five. I will spend a bit more time going through this code because this example illustrates a unique feature of the analysis strategy in this particular setting. The samples defined in the data model are different in this case from the samples used in the analysis of the primary endpoint. As you remember, there were four samples included in the data model that was defined on slide 55. But from the analysis perspective, we only need to examine the treatment effect within two samples. The placebo and treatment samples within the oral population and then within the marker positive subpopulation. And as a result, the first test that you see in this analysis model, 
which is the overall population test, compares the effect in the placebo arm to the effect in the treatment arm. But to define the placebo arm, we need to merge two samples from the data models. These are the samples labeled placebo marker negative and placebo marker positive. And likewise, to define the treatment arm for this overall population test, we need to merge the two samples defined in the data model. And those are labeled, as you see on the slide, treatment marker negative and treatment marker positive. And the second test in this analysis model is based on the treatment effect test in the subpopulation of marker positive patient. And this test is carried out, carried out based on the analysis samples that are exactly the same as the data samples. Specifically, these are the data samples labeled placebo marker positive and treatment marker positive. And finally, a multiplicity adjustment based on the Hogberg procedure is defined in this analysis model. The evaluation model, as I said a minute ago, has exactly the same structure as the evaluation model in example four. We begin with the success criterion based on marginal power and will be applied to the two tests defined in the analysis model to the overall population test and the marker positive subpopulation test. This evaluation will be performed at a one-sided alpha of 0.025. We continue on slide 60 and the second criterion to be applied in this clinical trial example is based on disjunctive power, which is again computed with respect to the two tests that were defined in the analysis model, the overall population test and the marker positive subpopulation test. The very last step, as in example four, is the specification of simulation parameters. The same set of simulation parameters is specified here. We request simulations based on 10,000 simulation runs over all available cores, and that's because the proc.load parameter is set to full. The uh, CSE function is called to perform simulations, and the summary function generates a simple summary of the simulation results. Here's the most relevant part of the simulation results. The, this table shows that in this event-driven trial, we will need a total of 530 events to achieve an 80% probability of success based on disjunctive power. I would like to point out that the marginal power within each patient population will be lower here. It actually happens to be almost the same in the overall population and in the predefined marker positive subpopulation in this particular case, but it does not have to be the same. We need to remember that disjunctive power is greater than marginal power for each individual test due to a synergistic effect. Mediana package. We have just, uh, just a couple of slides left and I would like to make two quick comments. An important component of the Mediana package is a set of tools for producing nice publication quality simulation reports. They are saved in a Microsoft Word format and they provide a detailed summary of all assumptions. This includes the assumptions from the data analysis and evaluation models. And of course, it also includes simulation results. Simulation reports are easy to customize. That's a very important and attractive feature of the Mediana package. And to create a custom report, we need to specify a presentation model. It must be defined by the user. The user can control the document structure. For example, sections and subsections can be created and various table options can be defined. You will find more information about presentation model options in the package's online manual. And you also find examples of simulation reports generated for multiple case studies. Here's the link to the online manual. You will find, as I said, several useful case studies that illustrate clinical scenario evaluation and clinical trial simulations in general, and they will help you understand the package's numerous options. The settings considered in these case studies include simple trial designs and analysis strategies. For example, a trial with two treatment arms and a single endpoint, but the 
primary endpoint, could be normally distributed, could be binary, could be time to event with or without censoring. And more advanced settings include clinical trials with several arms, several patient populations, and several endpoints. And you'll also find Mediana code from our book on clinical trial optimization that was published in 2017. Several examples in this book deal with clinical trials that employ multiple objectives. We are done with this online training course. I would like to thank you for your interest in the general topic of multiplicity in clinical trials. It's been my pleasure to provide a summary of key concepts key principles and provide a methodological foundation and then introduce multiplicity adjustments or multiple testing procedures that are commonly used in late stage trials. We've also touched upon numerous practical issues that arise in clinical trials with multiple objectives. This includes software implementation of popular multiple testing procedures and power calculations in clinical trials with multiple objectives. If you happen to have any questions, please feel free to contact me. You see my email on this last slide. And I would like to remind you again that this online training course focused on traditional multiplicity problems and advanced multiplicity problems are discussed in another course, the follow-up course, Key Multiplicity Problems in Clinical Trials Part 2. Thank you very much.